So welcome. We are thrilled to have Tiffany Bova here with us um, to talk about ecosystem-based competition. She's the chief growth evangelist at Salesforce. She's the author of the Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Growth IQ, Get Smarter About the Choices That Will Make or Break Your Business. Um, she spent a long time thinking about ecosystem-based competition, and she's witnessed from the inside of Salesforce.com how they have done that. Um, so we're thrilled to have her in the series. She's also ranked by Thinkers50 as one of the top management thinkers in the world. You can find her on Bloomberg, Cheddar, MSNBC, Yahoo Finance, among others. She's contributed to publications like Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Entrepreneur, Quora, Thrive, and others. Um, she's also the host of her own post podcast, What's Next with Tiffany Bova. It's an iTunes all-time business and management bestseller and a top sales podcast, according to Top Sales Magazine, um, with guests like Ariana Huffington and Dan Pink. So. Tiffany, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Oh, there's no place I'd rather be. I'm excited about the conversation. Excellent. Excellent. So the thesis here is that we have been emerging into an era where ecosystem-based competition is more important than before. Ecosystem competition has been around forever, right? But um, now it is becoming the central theme, if you will. Um, and you know, I know that you've written chapters in your book about it. You've been thinking about it. You've been um, doing it. Um, so, you know, first, I just like to ask, uh, wh what do you think of that thesis? Is that true? So I'm going to, I'm going to answer that, uh, two ways. One, I'm going to say it was very early in my career. I mean, very early in my career, like 1997. Um, and I was selling software. I was the only sales rep. It was a small little software company focused on the legal industry in Los Angeles, California. And uh, I had to, you know, call a hundred people a day, hopefully 10 people, you know, would answer three people would set a meeting and I might sell one or two of the hundred. It, I couldn't scale that. And I was reading law technology product news. It was a magazine at the time. And there was a full page ad from something called a value added reseller. And I'm like, what is that? And when I did a little investigating, I realized that this particular VAR, as they're called, would resell technology that was focused on the legal industry. And I'm like, well, <laughs> this is a no brainer. Like, do I sit here all day and call the hundred people and hope 10 call me back? Or do I do something with this particular company to have them represent our software to more customers than I could ever reach on my own? And that was kind of the door opener for me on the power of selling with and through partners mm -hmm. and leveraging what has now become sort of the ecosystem and alliance conversation. But that scale that I could get in, in selling that way was core to my career for 15 years. I actually became a channel chief across five or six different technology companies mm -hmm. in creating these ecosystems by which we could scale into particular in industries and verticals like public sector or finance or hospitality or even uh, healthcare. I've always been bullish on the power of those ecosystems. And when the cloud came along, sort of, you know, end of 99, 2000, I once again was uh, faced with an opportunity to be one of the first to create these kinds of programs that worked with and through these cloud-based partners. Okay. And uh, I can tell you that, you know, Salesforce was a whisper of what it is now, right? It's 23-year-olds, 23-year-olds, uh, 23 year old now. And, and I'd wow. say that, you know, back then it was, what is the partner? Who is the partner? How do we use them? Where in other industries outside of technology, I always use this example. You can't go to Heinz.com and buy ketchup. I always mm -hmm. pick on Heinz. I don't know why, but I okay. do. And like when my friends and family would be like, what do you do? And I go, well, you can't go to Heinz.com and <laughs> buy ketchup. You have to buy it from the grocery store. I help companies like Heinz in the technology space get their products into the shelves of CompUSA or Best Buy or through these value-added resellers. And so ecosystems in the supply chain have been 
the MO for so many industries for so long, cars, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have to go to a dealer. Uh, now some car companies are right trying catching on to what Tesla has done, but that direct to consumer kind of company bypassed those ecosystems, if you will. And some of them were able to do really good early on, but now you've seen them shift and they're also in retailers. So now they've had to expand that. So the reason I wanted to kind of set that context is, the conversation of ecosystem has been around forever. It's yeah. now just taking on a uh, different life because of, I would say, mobile, cloud, social, big data, and all the things that have really transformed business. Got it. It does feel to me, though, that a retail a grocery store that's selling Heinz ketchup, they are adding value, I guess, right? Because they're stocking, they are getting customers in the door, they are shelving, they're checking out, they're collecting. So those are all kind of value add, but it, it feels more, uh, I don't know, just the nature of that kind of relationship feels different to me than what I imagine the nature of relationship you developed with your VARs. Well, I'd say this, look, Shelf space in a grocery store is highly competitive. Yes, yes. <laughs> how much, how often, end caps, are you at eye level? Are you at floor level? Are you at can't reach it level? Like those are yeah. highly sought after space. And so, you know, it's similar. If you walk into a Best Buy today, it's the same thing. Where is the shelf space? Are you, do you have an end cap? Do you have your own store within a store? Those kinds of partnerships and, and what kind of relationship that is had, but you nailed it. It's about what is that value add? Is mm -hmm. it marketing development funds? Is it co-op dollars? Is right. it co-selling and cross-selling? Is it m maintenance and warranty support? You know, so a, a mm -hmm. company couldn't possibly do all of the support on their own. They need to bring in third parties that can service air conditioners or cars or whatever it might be. That is a day-to-day -day example of you may not, as a consumer, understand that that is all part of an ecosystem and supply chain that has a long tail effect yep. on a company's ability to be able to reach, service, and maintain relationships with customers. Right, right. Yeah, and I guess then the uh, shelf space that you get, that whether you get end caps or not, has to do with what you pay, but it also has to do with the bargaining power, which I guess has to also do with the attractiveness of your product relative to the reach of the of the um, retailer. So there's kind of this yeah, bargaining power between the partners. Yeah, and it was a force function. So think about those direct mm -hmm. con to consumer brands. Mm -hmm. They might not have been able to break into a retailer. They might have said, unless you're going to you know, do a million dollars a month, I'm making up that number, but as an example, a million dollars a month with us, we're, we're just, we're not able to give you shelf space. It's just too competitive, but we'll give it to you online. And they're like, well, if I'm just going to go online, I'll go online by myself and I'll try to establish a relationship with the customer directly. And so some of that was also because of the complexity of that sell with and sell through business uh, that has been established for decades and had not modernized itself to the fact that the web had really changed the way in which companies can reach and service and connect with customers. It didn't have to be brick and mortar. And I think that that forced those that maybe were brick and mortar to start to embrace online in a different way. And even opening up ecosystems to brands they wouldn't have in their retailer. They gave them availability on their online stores and almost tried to prove it out before they let them go, you know, onto the store shelves. So it has really been this interesting shift that kind of 2000, this chasm was crossed around opening up ecosystems to different kinds of partners um, as well, the opportunity to reach different kinds of customers in new ways through new channels. Okay. Okay. And so that might be the change that f even for older companies like Heinz who have been operating in an ecosystem model, um, it's because of the, I don't know, the, the, the digital uh, opportunities that how you engage with the ecosystem might've changed or, or, ha or has it, has it not changed? Has it been that, you know, there have always been ecosystem heavy companies uh, and now just there are more of them. Well, I mean, if, even if you just take car dealerships as an example, 
Like yeah. those aren't owned by the manufacturers. They are independent dealerships that are resellers of those particular cars. You have yeah. someone enter the market like a Tesla who says, nope, we're going to go direct to consumer. And oh, by the way, we're going to really minimize the supply chain. You have three choices, three colors, three builds. That's it. It's 500 bucks to register the car. When it shows up, you pay for it. We're done. <laughs> Yeah. That's very different than I'm going to go spend all day walking through the thousands of cars to choose from with 900 different option packages. And I have to sit down for two hours to negotiate the financing and I have to do all those things. There was a better way. And so now you see car companies really doing these blend of two things with the supply chain uh, challenges we're having right now are highlighting the fact that now you know, they're having less of an inventory. There's less availability. They're able to charge a premium on cars right now. You can't get one. The used car market has, mm -hmm. you know, uh, increased its prices. All kinds of impact has happened because that supply chain has been so disrupted. Yeah. Uh, but, but I would say that, look, the kinds of partners that you work with in traditional kinds of businesses that are, you know, hard goods, is mm -hmm. different than those kinds of partners you'd work with in the cloud, like the example of Salesforce that you gave at the beginning. Mm -hmm. They are different, yet, yet they are so similar, right? Mm -hmm. In the core value that they bring to a company, but also their expectations of as a partner in working with someone that's a big brand where they add so much value. I think the expectations are fairly similar. Got it. So um, then let's try to take a contrast between a non ecosystem comp company to an eco. So, what I'm trying to get at is um, what do you see as new or different things, whether those things are source of competitive advantage or key success factors or mindsets um, that a company that for whom an ecosystem is becoming more important, um, something that they need to add to their strategic toolkit. You know, for example, right now I'm, I'm going to be giving a speech later today for uh, uh, people in the steel industry and there they've got a dedicated workforce. They, they take in raw materials. You could call that ecosystem. It's really a supplier. I would say they add value to it and then they sell these rods or these plates to um, other manufacturers through a direct sales force. So not so much, not a whole lot of ecosystem kind of characteristics. So if you took that and compared it to, a Salesforce or um, a software company or a, a Tesla. What, what, what do you? What, what is a company? What, what are the differences in competitive advantage or key success factors? I'd say they are part of an ecosystem, but yeah. because they're part of that actual original, you know, an OEM in the technology space, that original equipment manufacturer, the person who delivers them the raw steel, they are one of the suppliers that is taking that and manufacturing it and then selling it out. So mm -hmm. they are part of an ecosystem. Um, now they may sell directly to end users, but there may be a small percentage, I don't know, because I don't know their business, that may mm -hmm. actually take those goods and resell it maybe to, you know, developers or architects or, you know, yep. Yep. You know state government or whatever it might be. Uh, so they are definitely part of an ecosystem. They just may play a piece and, right, something comes from someone, they do something to it and it keeps going. Right. But yeah. it is all part of that original steel manufacturer, right? Making its way through. And if sure. you think about coffee beans as an example, coffee mm -hmm. beans might cost, you know, five cents for a bag of coffee beans. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's starting way at the beginning of the supply chain. It then yes. makes it to, you know, I have, I just want a cup of coffee. And if I went to a restaurant, that cup of coffee might be a dollar fifty. Okay. Now yeah. it's gone from five cents to a dollar 50. Now somewhere along the line, right? It went from the grower to had to get to the restaurant. So it went to a distributor, right? And then it went to the supermarket and then it, you know, somebody then bought it for the restaurant or distributor and then they made the coffee and it's a dollar 50. So everyone's making a little money along the way. Mm -hmm. Or you go to a Starbucks and it's $5, but yet it was five cents for the coffee. So the value that gets added along the way also has tremendous impact on how much you're able to charge. So yeah. as someone in the ecosystem, you have to decide, am I going to be at the five cent business, dollar sure. 50 business or the $5 business? Right. And in each of those examples, you know, in the steel example, you might be making pennies on the dollar because you're just selling to raw goods that then gets made and they take it to make it the cup of coffee. But someone then makes it into a beautiful office. That's sort of the, you know, the Starbucks latte, right? That's the mm -hmm. kind of example there. 
But I'd say, you know, to your original question, like partner to partner collaboration has really gotten very interesting. So okay. partners in the ecosystem working together to solve problems together. Huh. And they may not be competitors necessarily. It could be like, look, I make a coffee machine. Okay, well, I make the filters, you know, right. but let's work together so we could maybe bundle our solutions. So when we sell it out, there's more value and we mm. have a competitive advantage versus someone who is selling it separately, requiring the customer to go to multiple places. And so partners working together when they can solve those kinds of problems um, has tremendous value in the supply chain. So I've really been excited to see P2P working more effectively when they're not competitors. But Got what's you. been amazing to see is over the last two years, you see this kind of coopetition where competing companies are working together to solve much bigger problems. And I think the vaccine is a great example of globally, right? Pharmaceutical companies in many ways working together to very quickly put together, you know, what could be tested and rolled out um, to solve a global crisis because it wasn't, you know, one country, one part of the world was, set, you know, feeling this situation. Everybody was feeling it simultaneously. Mm. Um, mm. And so when you see that cooperative kind of partnership in the supply chain, um, in ecosystems, that I think has a tremendous chance to change a lot of the ways in which products and services are delivered to the ultimate either consumer or the business they're servicing. And so those are two things I, I'm really mm. paying attention to, right? That P2P at the classic level where, you know, we're going to get together because we can, we can create a greater solution for ultimate customers. But then the other on that is actually working with someone you may view as a, a little bit of a competitor, but in the customer's eyes, if we could get together, it would be much better for them. I love that. Yeah, that's a real change, right? Because in the older model, um, you're fitting into an ecosystem and you're already taking, going from A to B, I know that I need to buy beans and I need to ground the, grind them to these specifications. Um, but if you can cooperate with the filter maker and the coffee maker and then change the type of ground beans, then you might be able to put together a, an offer that is a leap different than what customers are experiencing or what customers have now. It allows for kind of greater degrees of innovation. Yeah. And even if you think we stay on coffee, you could say, okay, Nespresso has a machine, they have their own pods, but yep. you know, Starbucks has said, well, like we don't want, we want to make pods for Nespresso machines because we don't, we want our coffee in there too. Even though someone brewing coffee at their home takes them away from coming into the store and spending five bucks. Yep. Right. And yep. so, you know, if you're a leader listening to this and you go, yeah, but I don't want to cannibalize my own business in that example of, mm -hmm. you know, I, nope, I want them to come into the store or, you know, nope, I'm going to make pods for somebody who is going to make coffee at home. You almost mm -hmm. want both. And so maybe I don't go into Starbucks as much as I would um, normally in my hometown. I do much more when I'm traveling because I have an espresso machine at home and I'll sort of mix and match coffees as an example. Right. Yeah. And so leaders sometimes get um, they get distracted by shiny things like, oh, this partnership is going to accelerate our growth. It's really going to put us on that hockey stick. That's one. Yes. Or the other is, no, why would I ever? push business through an ecosystem when it actually cuts into my profitability and I lose control over that relationship with the customer. I'd rather just sell it all direct mm. and own every piece of that um, supply and go to market model. And sure. I don't want to partner with everybody. Sure. Yeah. Which brings us back to that co-opetition mindset. Um, you know, it does, it does also seem that companies like Salesforce and I'm sure others that you've seen that they build the ecosystem around them. I think that's sort of different, right? Like Kraft probably plugged into an ecosystem and influenced it. It's been around for, I don't know, a hundred years or whatever. Um, but, you know, Salesforce had to build um, developers and Amazon Alexa's business had to build, uh, you know, you know, uh, people that could, uh, you know, um, you know, have things plug in, plug into the, into the network. So you have to, you have to build the ecosystem and get people to decide to even uh, engage with the ecosystem and not, and not players that are already there, but new players get, get, get a developer to, to, to build an app for your platform. Um, that seems like a, like the next level. No. Yeah. Well, 
Um, interestingly enough, I have two stories that sort of land right, right on top of that, right? One is uh, in my previous role prior to joining Salesforce, I was a research fellow at Gartner, which is sort of the world's largest IT analyst and consulting firm. And one of my customers, one of my clients, one of our clients at the time was Amazon AWS, actually. Mm -hmm. And they had no direct selling force um, and they had no partner ecosystem at the time. Mm -hmm. Just selling directly to end users because of the demand of sort of, I want to have some compute power, you know, that's not in my data center. They got to about a billion dollars without really a selling engine behind them. It was just mm -hmm. you know, technology, uh, engineers, um, IT people using their own credit card and saying, I need $10,000 with a compute for a burst because I'm doing an ad in the Super Bowl. I'm going to spend a million dollars for a compute burst, you know, for the ad during the Super Bowl, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But I went in and worked with that team on actually standing up what was going to be that indirect channel program. What was it going to look like to start to recruit developers? So ISVs, independent software vendors, uh, cloud service providers, um, others that would do consulting, maybe even doing custom dev, dev work, you know, yes. on actually making now an on-premise solution connect to AWS. And that had to happen in a secure way. Some, some clients wanted to actually lift and shift, right? They wanted to move their data center completely to the cloud, which needed this ecosystem. And so, you know, they were simultaneously hiring direct selling efforts, right? to sell out to the market, but they had to stand up an indirect channel program to attract these partners. The thing that worked in their favor was they already had about a billion dollars worth of revenue. So they'd proven the model. So partners were kind of coming mm -hmm. at them. They just didn't have a way to scale it. And by the way, oh, by the way, their biggest competitor, you know, in Seattle as well, has about 600,000 partners, sure. you know, in their channel program. Um, sure. And there was probably about, I don't know, 100,000 at the time. I'm really dating this. This is, I don't know, a decade ago um, of how many partners were actually, you know, even potentially going to be active in doing this. So if you were going to compete against such a big competitor that had such a large ecosystem, you better stand one up quick. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think because they're, they were a digital cloud first company, they attracted a lot of those born in the cloud partners a lot faster. Salesforce mm. was in the same position. Right. It was a born in the cloud company. They were able to attract those developers and consultants right on how could people implement software as a service into a business that is traditionally on premise. What does that look like? Uh, and very early on, Salesforce knew that they needed to leverage those partners. Now, a different mindset, though. It isn't a resale relationship. It is really an influence consulting integration mm -hmm. relationship. So some ecosystems are about resale, others are about influence, some have both. But, you know, that kind of, of situation in making those decisions about what is the best way to approach it has everything to do with who are your customers, how do they like to buy, what role would a third party play in that kind of sales motion, implementation motion, support motion. And some of you may be like, look, we're not in tech. We don't have that kind of thing, right? They buy from us one time. We may not see them again. But all you have to understand is who is the customer? How do they like to buy? Where do they like to buy? And what kind of value could potentially be wrapped around that? Am I going to do it myself? Am I going to hire for it? Am I going to partner for it? Am I going to connect with in a cooperation way? Or am I going to mm. connect, you know, in another ecosystem? There's all kinds of options. But hmm. I think, you know, look, I said it really quickly, but Many people get hung up on the, I will lose control, I will lose profit if I yes. work with third parties. And um, while I understand the argument, the scale win you get from it, if you start from what customers actually want and need from you, the answer would never be, it's always direct. And if I'm picking tech one more time, you know, Dell was known for direct by Dell. Michael Dell wrote a book called Direct by Dell. Mm -hmm. And it was only, you know, uh, sort of 2009-ish that he made the decision they wanted to go through third-party channels because their competitors, HP, IBM at the time, uh, Lenovo, uh, and others were, had the strong ecosystem. Now, right. if you, and I'm going to, you know, I'm gonna, don't hold me to this number because, you know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not paying quite as much attention as I did when I was at Gartner, but I think at this point, even with the acquisitions of uh, VMware and EMC and others, they're mm -hmm. at like 40% of their total revenue is through partners. Wow. So wow. 
make that decision, turn that corner. So it used to be direct. We want to own the relationship. We want to hold the profitability, right? We want mm -hmm. all that value. But the customer said, hold on a second. We actually need things you can't give us. And yes. if you're going to get to 10 billion and 20 billion and 30 billion and 50 billion, whatever it is, you're going to need partners. 40% of revenue of a company like that is no small number. So I would mm -hmm. say just look to industries where you know, those kinds, or Ford, a hundred percent is through partners, mm -hmm. Cisco, 95% is through partners, you know? Wow. I, and so you really have to think what, what is the, what is the value? Um, you, just putting to, to, I hate to ask you to repeat, but you, you listed a list of options. I was wondering if you just came up with that at the top of your head or you, if that's some, uh, some kind of list that you have, you said, you know, do I want a reseller? Do I want to go direct? Do I want a partner? Do I want to plug into a different ecosystem? Um, did you just make that up or did you, uh, is that, is that kind of a list that you have? Yeah. A list right here. You know, I, I, I have been in uh -huh. and around this space right since 1996, it's been almost, almost 30 years. So, you know, but, but I would say this, I think, and I talk about it in the book, uh, growth IQ. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I literally would start like this. If you're listening to this and you are contemplating whether an ecosystem partners is a way for you to grow and scale, um, and or even service your customers in a different way, start with the customer. Yeah. What yeah. do they want? How do they want to buy? What can you deliver today? You can't be everywhere, right? And unless you have endless, you know, ability to spend money, you, you can't try everything. You, you have to then say, what are we capable of doing ourselves? What can't we do ourselves? If what we can't do, can we fill in those gaps using these kinds of ecosystems and alliances. Now you may say, well, there isn't one already out there. We're going to have to do it on our own. Isn't that expensive? Isn't yep. there a lot of risk? Yep. yep. And I said it pretty quickly. Like many executives yep. will go, if we do this one deal with this one big partner, it's mm -hmm. going to change the game for us. And you're giving way too much credit because you might be one of many things they sell, but you yep. have to lean into it and, and try with a handful of partners learn from it, but having structure around that kind of program in understanding mm -hmm. where, how, and why you would use partners versus go direct or co-sell or co-service or co-develop um, yeah. or co-deliver. There are all kinds of options, but you can't do it all. So if you start with your customers and you look at the you know, the highest sort of percentage that are looking to do things a certain way from you, then that's where I'd begin. Uh, yep. But I would not tell you today that direct, 100% direct is the is the best way to go. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think it's a great distinction between a deal and a program. That's a, a different mindset as well. Um, so I want to shift a little bit um, and look at the organization as an ecosystem, you know, Salesforce, from my understanding from the outside has a very unique culture, organizational model, incentive structures, that kind of thing that make it, um, more agile. Right. So I would imagine like working at Salesforce, I have more freedom than working at, um, McDonald's, let's say. Um, but there are companies that are like, that are adapting more agile models and they're starting to look almost like ecosystems within the walls. Um, have you looked at that or thought about that? Well, I, I'd say this, you know, uh, Salesforce has um, invested a ton in uh, an ecosystem that we call the App Exchange, uh, which is applications that are built in and around the Salesforce technology by independent software vendors. Um, we've got thousands of them now uh, online, and I think we just hit our millionth download so it's significant impact. And in parts of the world, we, you know, rely on partners heavily, right, to even help us sell. But for sure, in implementation and consulting and customization um, and integration on-prem with potentially other applications uh, that need to have access to Salesforce information or vice versa, those partners are critical to our success. And look, Customer success is one of our core tenants. If our customers are not successful, we're not successful, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if they have 50 licenses, 500 licenses, 5,000 licenses, and they're growing and they need more licenses, good for us. If yep. they're not growing and they need less licenses, bad for us, right? And yep. so being able to support that is one thing. But we also have an ecosystem called Trailblazers, which uh, is really based on 
uh, a, a website we have, a platform we have called Trailhead, which is online learning, um, can give certification for free to anybody. You don't have to be a Salesforce customer uh, or mm -hmm. not. So someone working at McDonald's who says, I want to get into technology, I'm going to get a certification through Trailhead. We call them our trailblazers. And our trailblazer community is an ecosystem that is has a life of itself. They create chapters on their own. You know, they get together on their own. Uh, they support each other on their own. We recognize those um, that are really, uh, you know, doing amazing things out in the market. Uh, you know, those uh, vehicles to give back. So I'd say that yeah. that's also a view on kind of an, an ecosystem, right? Of people yes. who are in the Salesforce family, but not, not, might not work for us. And we need millions of them because we have so many customers that require internal capabilities, we have to make sure that those people um, have the opportunity to learn how to do things, whether you're an administrator or a seller, right? You're using the technology, whatever it might be. So you have to think of those ecosystems as, you know, value add like we do for Trailhead and all of our trailblazers or yes. the app exchange, which is really about giving those kind of vertical capabilities or integration points or even custom development um, for something using the Salesforce platforms across our multiple clouds or even on Heroku. And now we have Tableau and we have Slack. There's so many other things that, that mm -hmm. you really can do. But I think the message here is we knew what we were willing to do and capable of doing. Then we knew what we weren't and you need to make those investments. And it is absolutely part of who we are because we're so hyper-focused on customer success. If yeah. we weren't so hyper-focused on customer success, you'd be like, ah, oh, you know, you have an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You don't have an ecosystem. Like, what's the difference? But if our customers aren't successful, we are not successful. So it was, you know, absolutely part of, of who we are. Interesting. I wonder if we find out that that is a, a prerequisite uh, for being able to really build out indirect revenue through ecosystems is to be hyper focus on customer success success or, or customer centric. Well, that's what I said, right? If you're going to try to make this decision, start with the customer Yeah, and then work yep. back on who are they? How do they like to buy? Where do they like to buy? Are you able to deliver in all those channels? Probably not. And then if you have the requirement of implementation and support and all of those kinds of things. Yep. You know, you're an air conditioned manufacturer. Can you go and install at everyone's house, you know, across the right. country? Uh, right. Can you service them all? Right. Can you replace them all? My, I'm right. going to guess your answer is probably no. So right. how are you going to get people trained on your air conditioner product on how to repair it? You want to be a certified repair person for that. Kind of, you know, I'm going to date myself, but you remember the commercials on the Whirlpool <laughs> repairman, yep. right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Not all of them worked for Whirlpool, but they were certified to represent Whirlpool, you know, out in the field. They might've worked for Sears. They might've worked for JCPenney. They might've worked independently. But the point is, is that, you see them as a whirlpool repairman. Yes. But that, think about trailblazers, right? Think about trailhead. You have to certify and train them, keep them up to date on what that is. Right. So even if it's just training ecosystem, right? And making yeah. sure they know how to use, deploy, support uh, what your products are, what your products and services are. I, I mean, that's why being customer, that customer success is such a critical part to making the right decision for your company, wherever you are in your growth journey. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. That's like another, I'm almost imagining that there are these different uh, concentric circles of control or, you know, that you have employees, um, then you'll have these very close, uh, uh, partners of your ecosystem who are well-trained and, and, and go to the client with your brand. And then you're going to have like your suppliers and B2B partners that are collaborating with you. And then you'll probably have the, um, uh, what is, what does Michael Porter call them? The, um, a complementary products that maybe you have no contractual or organization with, but, but consumers use them, or your buyers use them with, um, with their products with yours. So, I mean, and you can even, so close to the core, you know, yeah. you know, if you have a beachhead product, so I'm just going to pick on Heinz again, you might say, well, what's the, what's the ecosystem play on Heinz chefs, mm -hmm. people who cook at home. Yep. So I buy Heinz. If I go to Heinz.com, maybe I can get recipes on how to make barbecue sauce with Heinz. Yes. People can post stuff. Now you've got this vibrant customer driven ecosystem of like-minded people who like to cook and come up with creative you know, recipes for Heinz. 
I'm stretching here off the top of my head, but I think you get the idea, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be complex. It could just be like-minded. There's, I was flying back from San Francisco to LA when I was writing Growth IQ and I sat next to this gentleman who owned a textile business. And I actually used him as an example in front of my customer base penetration story uh, chapter. And he had a hundred thousand customers. He sold textiles. Like he just sold fabric, but he didn't know those customers. And I'm like, what a miss. So I started sharing with him, like, what if you started sharing patterns and you had people, you know, share the patterns they've used or what they did with a particular fabric you had or how they did certain things. He was looking at me like, oh, I never would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. Instead it was a, you know, like, I'm just going to sell this person fabric and whatever they do with it is fine. And they may never buy from me again. I'm like, what a mm -hmm. shame. Like mm -hmm. what a shame, right? Instead of, you know, maybe you create sewing clubs or you do things right. where you get like-minded people together. So, right. you know, ecosystems are, uh, if you think about it that way, I think everybody can have some idea with their particular business on how they might be able to either get like-minded people together, help them get scale, help them provide better service and coverage to customers, and maybe even work with other partners to create that kind of solution um, that, or, you know, uh, kind of product that's already pre-integrated that people may want. And so you, if you keep the customer front and center, you're always going to be open to these kinds of ideas. But if it's like, we don't do it this way, we're going to give right. up profit and control, you know, that kind of lack of, you know, a fixed mindset. Yeah. You've got no business having this conversation if you're not doing it now, because you're going to need <laughs> a beginner's mind, a growth mindset mm -hmm. to be willing to try these kinds of things. Wow. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, this has been, this has been fascinating for, for me and I'm sure for our viewers and listeners, um, you have introduced some really important distinctions that is at least got my mind spinning and yet also given us some very clear first steps about focus on what your customer needs, can you deliver it all? And then do I want to, how do I want to engage with those that would deliver those elements of value for me? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say one, one more thing just on that sure. customer yep. is don't make the mistake that you think, you know, what your customers want. Hmm. Surveying them once a year, having a casual conversation is going to land you in, um, you know, a situation where you've lost touch with those customers. So you have to go on a listening tour virtually or in person and find out what is it really, what is really going on? Because if you're going to say, I'm going to make decisions based on what we just talked about on information I, grant, I gathered before the pandemic, you're definitely going to get yourself in trouble. A year ago, you're probably still going to get yourself in trouble. Even 90 days ago, now the world is starting, depending on where you're listening to this, is starting to open back up. That may have implications as well, but we're still in a supply chain crisis. So yep. we have to find um, ways where you can carve out an hour a day where you just talk to customers. Hmm, and I, I will tell you when the pandemic first hit, our co-CEO, Mark Benioff, the founder, co-founder of Salesforce, he gave us a challenge of having 1 million conversations with customers, not hmm. 1 million demos, not 1 million price, you know, not 1 million RFP responses, but conversations so we could understand the jobs to be done that completely reshaped what we were doing over the last 18 months. Now that we're coming out the other side of it, we can, you know, regroup one more time, but we ended up doing over six and a half million conversations wow. and now it's embedded in everything we do. So that's the kind of habits you have to build um, in order to keep up with what your customers expect from you. That makes a ton of sense. That makes a ton of sense. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, and it has been um, like really a, a, a flow of um, insights and ideas. And, you know, I can tell you've been thinking about this for a long time and living it. So that's you're in a very special position of both being a thought leader and a practitioner. And thank you for, for being here with us. Again, thank you for having me. And I love the conversation. I love talking about partners and ecosystems. So thanks for asking. Thanks.